much, and thank you to Intelligence Squared for uh, organizing uh, this event. I am Nadir Musavizadeh, Chief Executive of Oxford Analytica, and I will be chairing the conversation this evening, and what we're going to try to do is on what is obviously a subject of uh, great interest, great concern, and some uh, substantial uh, dispute and debate, uh, try to have as uh, intelligent a conversation about this as uh, we can. Uh, we're going to try to avoid having too much of the uh, predictable, known, uh, somewhat um, worn positions restated uh, from various perspectives this evening, but really try to dig a little and uh, perhaps have more of a uh, challenging conversation between uh, the very, very distinguished and terrific panel we have and try to maybe end the evening a little uh, smarter about this question and a little better informed about the choices uh, that face the world broadly uh, in how to uh, deal with the question of Iran. Uh, we're going to do this is in a way that is hopefully as interactive as possible, uh, both among members of the panel but also you in the audience. So if I could ask uh, those of you who are eager to engage uh, to start thinking early about questions you have or things that particularly uh, uh, offend you or otherwise interest you that is said by various members of the panel. I, am no doubt, I have no doubt that some or all of them will, will uh, succeed in that. Uh, please do uh, be prepared to uh, raise your questions. I'm going to come in from time to time during this uh, period of an hour and some time and ask for questions and we'll obviously try to have a conversation that covers the key questions uh, around Iran. Now, uh, without much further ado, uh, what I will uh, not do uh, is really read the uh, bios of all the panelists. You have them in front of you. Uh, but just to say uh, quickly, on my right is Mark Dubowitz. Uh, to his right is Daniel Levy. Uh, to his right is uh, Roxanne Farman Farmayan. And uh, at the end of the uh, panel is uh, Fawaz Jeja and on the screen, and we'll come to you, Max, probably second, if that's okay with you, uh, is Max Boot, who is uh, in from the United States. Uh, we are going to start with Fawaz, and that is uh, partly to do with the regional dimension of this, which is one very important dimension, but also to discuss Syria. Uh, we're obviously meeting uh, at a time where Syria is more on the front pages and at the front end of the international agenda given the terrible violence in the country, but also the international attention uh, with Kofi Annan at the Security Council today, uh, discussing his view of a path uh, forward uh, on, the, on this uh, important mission. Uh, Syria is important not only in its own right, but also because it is uh, certainly a place where some of the large regional rivalries are playing out. And I think, Fawaz, if you could say a few words to start us off, uh, give us a sense of where you see the Syria situation, but very much with a view uh, to helping us understand what is the Iran, a dimension of that, what is the Iranian game, and how much is the solution to Syria uh, going to have to involve Iran one way or the other? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, the Syrian crisis, uh, even though uh, it's an essentially political crisis, has already turned into a protracted uh, armed conflict. Uh, and what worries many of us is that uh, the Syrian uh, conflict has taken more and more, or has become more and more uh, a sectarian one. Uh, I think, unfortunately for the Syrian people, the Syrian, the Assad regime, has imposed its own narrative uh, on an essentially political uh, conflict. And more and more Syrians are falling um, on their uh, local and provincial loyalties, uh, whether they are Sunnis or Alawites um, and Christians and Kurds and Druze and what have you. And I think what we have seen in the last few weeks in particular, I think the significance of the massacres, whether in Homs or Hula uh, or Hama, I think the mass what the massacres do is to really intensify and escalate sectarian tensions in Syria, particularly between the minority-led government, the Alawite minority-led government of President Assad and the uh, Sunni-dominant majority. Uh, Syria today reminds me of Lebanon in 1975, the beginning of the civil war. In terms of uh, 
car bombings, assassinations, massacres. We came to really understand the Lebanese civil war in terms of massacres uh, from 1975 to 1990s. We look at various faces and how every face was marked by a particular massacre. And I would argue, unfortunately and sadly, we're gonna come to see Syria in particular in terms of Baba Umar massacre, in terms of the Idlib massacre, uh, the Azur massacre, the Hula massacre, the uh, Qusayr massacre and what have you. Uh, and the fear, my fear is that if the bloodshed continues, if the uh, massacres continue, um, there is a high probability, likelihood, that Syria could easily plunge into all-out sectarian uh, strife, sectarian war, similar to that of Iraq and Lebanon, and Lebanon 1970s and 80s, and Iraq after the US-led uh, invasion and occupation uh, in, 19, in 2003. The reason why some of you might wonder why, what's different about the Syrian crisis. I think the received wisdom on Syria uh, has proven wrong, as you all know. Uh, Assad's days, uh, far from being numbered, uh, Assad will be with us for quite a while, unfortunately, for the Syrian people. For the simple reason is that the Assad regime, as I mentioned earlier, has imposed its own narrative on this particular crisis as a protector of minorities. You go to Syria, the Christians in Syria seem to be much more supportive of Assad than the Alawites and many of the Druze and the Kurds as well, because he has really succeeded in portraying himself that he is either me or chaos, either me or Iraq or uh, Lebanon. And several factors, and I know I don't have much time, I have a minute and a half to just throw some ideas on the table. I think we underestimated, not we, I mean the, the received wisdom, that basically the security forces um, has proven to be much more resilient and cohesive than the, um, many of us in the West uh, uh, had believed that so far the defections, really very few defections in terms of high-level security and, 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 and senior generals. The first few weeks of the Libyan crisis, more than 60% of the Libyan security apparatus collapsed. More than 50% of the diplomatic corps basically defective, hardly any in Syria, for a variety of reasons. We can explain uh, why. Another major reason I think the received wisdom really uh, uh, misunderstood the crisis in Syria is that despite everything that has happened, Assad retains a critical segment of social support inside Syria. This is a very important point to highlight, that far from being uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, I mean, uh, lacks public support, I think, and again, we're speculating, I would argue that his social base of support is between 30% and 40%, give and take. And we can talk about why is it so. And here we're speculating wildly. And the, the, the third component of why we underestimated and why we misunderstood the Syrian crisis is that uh, in contrast to the Libyan crisis, Syria, the Syrian crisis, has been caught in a fierce regional uh, cold war. And this brings me to the question of Iran. Why Iran has emerged as a pivotal player uh, in the Syrian crisis. In Libya, as you know, Muammar al-Qadhafi did not really have uh, money takers or money buyers. He basically mastered the art of making enemies. In the case of Syria, Assad retains not only a critical segment of social support inside Syria, he has major regional uh, allies, particularly Iran uh, and Hezbollah and Iraq. In fact, I would argue the Tehran-Baghdad road has become the lifeline of Assad. Uh, Iran now is playing a critical, pivotal role in sustaining and maintaining the cohesiveness of the Assad uh, killing uh, machine. In terms of intelligence, in terms of resources, in terms of goods, in terms of services, in terms of technology, and also in terms of, again, we don't have the full story, we don't have access to intelligence. Um, and not just Iran, I'm talking about Iraq in particular, that is uh, the, the government of Nouri al-Maliki, uh, which was uh, Maliki himself, a product of the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq. Remember, Iraq was supposed to be a democracy, yet Iraq now provides the lifeline of the Assad regime. And now what has happened in Syria is that Syria has become a uh, theater, a battlefield, a war by proxy, where the Saudis and the Turks on the one hand and Iran and Iraq are waging a major conflict for regional suprem supremacy. On top of this regional, I mean, conflict, and this is where the danger lies, is the sectarian divide. Uh, 
because the way the conflict, the way this particular Cold War is playing itself now um, on, in the, on the shifting sands, and the shifting sands here is that Iran is seen as the head of the uh, 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 Shiite uh, dominated alliance, and Saudi and, and Turkey uh, are seen as part of the Sunni. And this is where the danger lies, because if if Syria descends into all-out sectarian strife, as seems to be the case, Syria is uh, gradually and systematically descending um, into all-out war. I think the reverberations of the Syrian crisis, the, the, the spillover of the Syrian crisis will be felt in Lebanon, in Jordan, uh, um, even in Iraq and the region itself. And, and that's why now more and more voices, including Kofi Annan and the Russians are saying we must expand the contact group for Syria, we must bring Iran in, because I think at the end of the day, I believe that the Iranians know that Assad will not be with us uh, in the long term, that his ship is sinking, and the Iranians being who they are, uh, pragmatic Machiavellian players, will make deals, will make deals because they want to preserve their interests, because Hezbollah um, and, and other issues uh, are involved. The question is, uh, will the United States and the Western powers entertain any role uh, for Iran, or will this particular crisis in Syria play itself out to the end, and uh, uh, the reverberations will be felt, uh, I mean, uh, near and far. I want to stop here. Right. So Thank you.